I'll bring the Butte Silver Bow Council of Commissioners meeting uh, Committee of the Whole of August 26th to order. Um, if the clerk would please do a roll call. We have eight present, one presiding, and three absent. Let the record re reflect John Soros, Cheryl Ralph, and Cindy Shaw are excused. Um, at this time, would you please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance? And to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Next on the agenda is the report of the chair. Just a couple of things that I'd like to mention. Um, first off, I'd like to welcome those that are listening to this very first live broadcast at meeting on 102.5 FM radio, KBMF. Um, the other thing that I'd like to report is just a reminder of or to the commissioners that there's a special meeting on Monday at 5.30 to discuss the resolution of levies for the budget that we passed last week. And that is all that I have for the report of the chair. <coughs> Moving on to section one, which is a bid opening, communication number 15 366. Dan Dennehy, Director, Emergency Management Agency, requesting council's authorization to hold a bid opening on August 26th, um, 20, 2015, regarding maintenance and repairs of Butte Silver Bow radios and electronic equipment at the 911 center. At this time, I'd ask the county attorney for proof of publication. Mr. Chairman, there is proof of publication and it does appear to be in order. Thank you. Mr. Dennehy. Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, the one and only proposal that we have is from Dunn Communications, 204 East Commercial Street, Anaconda, Montana. Mr. Dennehy. Mr. Chair, members of the council, we uh, requested a 10% bid bond for this proposal and it does not appear that Mr. Dunn has submitted either a insurance um, security bond or a check at this time. County Attorney Joyce, how should we proceed? Um, Mr. Chairman, since he didn't meet the requirements of the um, bid proposal, um, I believe Mr. Denny, he will just have to restart the process. Okay. I know you guys want to see me more often, but. <laughs> so we will move on to the next item on the agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Section two, which is a public hearing, communication number 15-357. Karen Burns, Director of Butte Silver Bow Community Development Department, requesting council's authorization to hold a public hearing on August 26, 2015, regarding a developer's packet proposal for 208 South Washington and 821 Highland Avenue. Um, Ms. Burns, or She's not available, Dory Skookerud, for a staff report, please. Oh, excuse me. Uh, County Attorney Joyce, may we get a proof of publication? Mr. Chairman, there is a proof of publication, and it does appear to be in order. Thank you. Dory. Thank you, um, 
Mr. Chairman, members of the council, my name is Dory Scrickard. I'm the Community Development Coordinator in the Office of Community Development. I'm here to brief you um, prior to the public hearing associated with our request for proposals for the redevelopment of 208 South Washington Street and 821 Highland Avenue. Um, I would note to you that we did receive one application for the Highland Avenue redevelopment that was withdrawn at the time of our um, public presentations, which occurred yesterday on the 25th. And on Tuesday, the 25th, the two applicants um, for the redevelopment of 208 South Washington Street appeared before the Developers Packet Review Committee and made presentations in regards to their specific proposals. The applicants for the redevelopment of 208 South Washington Street are Todd Brown and Jane Wetmore and Cameron Moylan. Um, just briefly, 208 South Washington is located on the southeast corner of Mercury and Washington Streets. So it's just across the street from St. Pat's. Um, it's also behind the um, parking lot that serves uh, Mercury Street Medical. Um, the property is, um, is kind of unusual. Um, it has a rear structure, a structure on the alley um, that predates 1884. So it was constructed first. Then the Washington Street House was constructed um, sometime between 1884 and 1888. And the whole, um, those structures were tied together with shed additions to the rear of the alley house and the Washington Street House and a large wooden wood frame structure that spans between the two. So it is from um, Washington Street to the alley um, built up like that. Um, the property is considered a contributing property in the Butte Anaconda National Historic Landmark District. And the applicants have been advised um, in the event that a proposal includes um, a significant alteration to any portion of the structure or proposed demolition that they will be required to meet um, the provisions of the Historic Preservation Ordinance. The purpose of this public hearing is to, to solicit public comment about this public offering of um, county-owned property. On the back of this, I have a, just a real brief chart. Um, the applicants did meet all the requirements um, of the developer's packet with respect to those submittals, um, uh, putting together estimates um, and the, their level of investment, the property descriptions, um, uh, schedules, and commitments for financing, and then, of course, a neighborhood benefits statement. Um, I'm going to... And now, unless you have any specific questions. Do any of the commissioners have any questions for Ms. Skookerud? Uh, Commissioner Fisher, then Commissioner Purdue Dolan. Uh, thank you, Chairman Morgan. I don't really have any questions. I, I did visit with Dory a little bit at the beginning of this. I would just like to mention that these two properties, um, a month or so ago were before us, and we had a proposal to sell uh, one property for $5,500 and the other for $2,100. And we elected not to do that, but to put it out on the developer's packet, which now tonight we will accept $500 per property with some contingencies. But the developer at that time was willing to go along with those contingencies. So I was told by Dory that there's some conflicting ordinances that causes us to do these things. And I just wanted to make that evident to everyone before they made a public comment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. Commissioner Purdue Dolan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I was just going to ask uh, Dory why the price was so low on these two properties. That's quite a bargain, $500. And Commissioner Fisher alluded to my question. Can you answer why $500 a piece? Mr. Dolan. Chairman, um, Commissioner Dolan, um, these properties have both been offered or have been offered twice on the tax sale and did not sell at the tax sale to redeem those, those delinquent taxes. It's um, been a practice to set, I mean, we, we range from 500 to 1500, actually more for larger, probably commercial based structures. Um, the reason for this um, significantly um, decreased um, offering price is that there are there are requirements um, that any applicant is going to have to meet um, they do have to commit to a re redevelopment agreement 
Um, and at this time, you know, we, we get a number of different applications, a different approaches to a project, and so um, a successful developer will work with our office to put together a contract, and that's based on their individual proposal. They are also required to meet certain measures based on a, their schedule that they've submitted to us. And um, in the case of these developers' packets, we do require that they sign a clawback deed. So in the event um, that the project just falls apart or for some reason they can't complete the project, the county can step in and take them back. We feel like the $500 is a good faith um, gesture and effort and commitment on, the, on behalf of any specific applicant um, to participate in this program, um, but they also are sort of intrinsically tied to the Community Development Office and our staff to monitor their, their um, progress on, on the project. So, it, so we don't just let them, you know, I mean, in the case of selling it straight to them, we don't have any, any participation in, a, in the potential timeline and components of redevelopment. Follow up, Commissioner Peruto. Thank you. Um, I don't see a timeline on here. Can you tell us the timeline that they have for phase one and phase two for the restoration? I can if you'll let me, excuse me. Um, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Dolan, um, and I apologize for not having this on hand. Um, with respect to the um, proposal submitted by Todd Brown and Jade Wetmore, um, they have um, Their phase one is the West Cottage, the Washington Street Cottage, that would be completed in April 2016. That includes, um, they also um, have proposed demolishing the interior building, which will require that they um, submit a demolition um, request to the Historic Preservation Commission. Um, so they, their project um, for the first phase would be um, completed in April 2016. And um, the subsequent project, which is the conversion of the rear building to the carriage house, would be completed um, in August 2016. Do any other commissioners have any questions? Oh, oh. oh you still have another one. Apologize. Um, Mr. Moylan's project, um, is that he would have all proposed renovations to the interiors of both house and the middle building completed by May 1st, 2016. Um, he would also have, um, there's additional foundation repairs, re-roofing and um, brick repairs, primarily exterior work by July, 2016. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the commissioners? Okay, seeing none. At this time, I will open up the public hearing for communication number 15-357. I would ask for proponents. Are there any proponents? Third and, oh, please come up to the microphone and state your name and address for the record. Cameron Moylan, 1455 Hidden Valley Road. Bozeman, Montana. Oh, Mr. Moylan. Thank you all for giving me this time to speak. What I have to say this evening is fairly simple, and it is that out of the, these three applicants, it is that out of these three applic applicants who are intended, interested in the property at 208 South Washington Street, I would make the best owner. With approximately $75,000 at my disposal, I am the only one who can actually pay out of pocket for the major renovations that I have proposed. Also, I am the only one who plans on living at the place potentially for the rest of my life. As you all well know, I was also the first of the applicants to become interested in this property, making several attempts since April to purchase it. Your hands were tied then 
by a state law that frankly does not make any sense. Now my hands are tied as I am only able to offer $500 for the property. You are free to choose who the next owner will be. And I promise that if you choose me, you will not be disappointed by my consistency in paying my property taxes, my aesthetic improvements to the property, or the wealth that I'll bring to the area through my merchandise business. All these things are a promise, and I'll make them all happen if I am sold the property at 208 South Washington Street. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moylan. Second call for proponents. Chris Harris, 820 West Galena. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the council. Um, I'd like to speak on behalf of Todd Brown and his proposal. I've seen his work. Um, it was quite a challenging project that he did. Uh, in the alley on 836 West Granite, uh, new back porch, access to it, uh, involved an architect, structural engineer, it was very challenging trying to make, get the most out of the, the limited space that they had. Uh, and I was, uh, was pretty impressed and that's not an easy thing to do. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Third and final call for proponents. Okay. At this time, I would ask for opponents. If there's anybody in the audience who would like to speak as an opponent to this. Second call for opponents. Third and final call for opponents. Seeing none, I will close the public hearing. Moving on to section three, presentation communication number 15-385. Nicole Ivankovic, Assistant Director Archives, requesting council's authorization for a presentation to be given on the root and the bloom program on August 26th, 2015. Ms. Ivankovic. Thank you, Chairman Morgan, Council of Commissioners. My name is Nicole Ivankovic and I'm the Assistant Director of the Butte Archives. I would like to thank you all for letting us present the successes of the root and the bloom program at the Clark Chateau this evening. Ms. Carson Becker and Ms. Callison Stratton will briefly share information about the program and the phenomenal following they have built for both the program and the Chateau this summer. Under the umbrella of the Butte Archives in the direction of Ms. Becker and Ms. Stratton, the Chateau has transformed into a beautiful, living, breathing place for the humanities, and we are fortunate to have them on staff. I would like to now introduce Ms. Carson Becker to share more information about the program. Thank you. Ms. Becker. <laughs> Good evening, Chairman and Council of Commissioners. So, The Root and the Bloom, um, we are a humanities organization committed to maintaining and preserving the Clark Chateau, bringing quality programming to both youth and adults, promoting community building, independent thinking, and intergenerational dialogue. Our youth outreach mission includes creative engagement, enhancing literacy, both cultural and language, promoting self-esteem, mental health, collaboration, mentorship, and community involvement. Um, our summer youth program, which was created and run by Callison and myself, uh, it hosted eight students ranging from the ages 15 to 17. We hosted an eight-week internship, which consisted of weekly arts and humanities workshops. Um, we had invited guest artists and community leaders that worked with the kids, and then the result was a student-conceived and directed final project, which um, all of them are now being shown at the Art Chateau, uh, at the Clark Chateau um, in our uh, gallery space. Um, and all of them are thematically based on the student's uh, personal relationship to Butte. Um, out of our youth program um, came two surprises, uh, two student organized and led evenings. One was an art therapy workshop. Um, it was uh, conceived of by a team, um, but it was attended by an intergenerational group, which proved to be a very powerful and successful evening. And second, uh, we had a teen open mic 
that was held in the ballroom. Um, it was a fundraiser for our internship program and proved so successful that they asked if they could continue it. And so we will continue to have an open team mic at the Chateau. Um, our adult programming uh, consisted of three lectures, um, one by Suzanne Stefanik, um, David Abrams, and Edwin Daub. Um, our uh, since June, um, we have averaged three events a month, um, including Art Walk, and all have been very well attended. And with that, I'm going to pass it on to Callison, and she will share with you. Um, Chairman Morgan, Council Commissioners, I'm Callison Stratton. I'm the manager at the Chateau, um, and I'll talk to you about our financial success this summer. Um, if you look at the first page of the packet I handed out, um, you'll see that we had over a thousand visitors this summer, which is double what we had last year. Um, and we raised over $4,000 in the three short months that the Root in the Bloom has been at the Chateau. Um, the majority of our, uh, our revenue came from admissions for tours, um, but then second most was uh, through special events. And um, through our special events, even though all of these events, we've uh, maintained a commitment to make them uh, free to anyone who can, we have a suggested donation. And even through this suggested donation, we've uh, raised 24% of our, um, our profits this summer this way. Um, and then we noticed that our book sales were the lowest uh, form of revenue that we found this summer. And so to remedy that, we're working on developing our gift shop to further monetize the Clark Chateau to make it more sustainable. And we'll be opening in December to um, our gift shop to local artisans to display and sell their work. Um, and for the future, we're, um, we're opening the Chateau again for rentals, for weddings, events, film shoots, um, and fashion photography shoots. And we're currently contracting with several individuals to that end um, for the coming months um, to, to ensure that the Chateau remains a money-making uh, place. Um, finally, to conclude, uh, we've provided in your packet at the very end um, several letters of support. Um, these are all letters from our interns who were in the internship program that Carson mentioned. Um, also our lecturers, Edwin Dobbs, Suzanne Stefanik, and David Abrams all contributed letters and volunteers and community members who've all been impacted by our programs throughout this summer. Um, and they're all, all of these letters are meant to demonstrate the, their support for our efforts and their imploring butte and um, to continue to do the same in the future. Um, so any member of our community can visit our website um, or our Facebook or any of our social media in order to further interact with the Chateau and learn more about what we're doing. Um, thank you, Chairman Morgan and Council Commissioners for having us here today. And I'll conclude unless you have any more questions for myself or Carson. Thank you. Are there any commissioners that have any questions? Uh, Commissioner Cindy Purdue Dolan. Um, thank you for this uh, packet, and uh, I have a question. The Clark Chateau and has a wonderful history, and I'm wondering why, just a, a glance about, and just quickly reading about your mission statement and why you're not focusing about the Clark Chateau's history and the history of Butte, let me read a couple quick things and ask your your answer to this. You state here, creative, imagining, innovating, thinking flexibly, flexibly and exponentially, thinking about thinking, striving for accuracy, metacognition. What do these things have to do about Butte history and the Clark Chateau? Um, Commissioner Purdue Dolan, um, I first and foremost, you'll notice in our mission statement that the first thing is, um, I hope it's in there, uh, that our, our primary goal is to preserve the Clark Chateau as a historic place, first and foremost. Um, I am a trained public historian by, um, I received my master's in public history and cultural heritage from Trinity College Dublin in Ireland. And, um, and my uh, professional expertise is in presenting history in accessible ways to the public. Um, all of the list that you included here, all of these ways of furthering thought. Um, these are all, Carson and myself believe that these are necessary um, 
these are necessary channels through which we perceive history and better understand it and internalize it within our own lives and to better present it to the public in accessible ways so that history is becoming part of their um, part of their life and they, they can embrace it. And if you look at the um, some of the reflections from our youth program, all of their projects looked at Butte history through their own perspective. And that was the primary, um, like the, the initial uh, point of our program, our internship programs, was to look at history through artistic mediums in order to better reach a diverse group of people in Butte and to make them think about Butte in their own ways. Um, so I would argue that metacognition, all of these different ways of thinking are beneficial to ultimately interpreting the history of the Clark Chateau. And if I may follow up, we are also um, working on developing new exhibits. Um, I'm using my experience as a curator um, and as a public historian to develop new exhibits for the Clark Chateau and emphasize its history for our visitors. Thank you. Any other questions from the commissioners? Seeing none, thank you guys for what you do. It looked like it was a great project. Yes. Chairman Morgan. Thank you very much. Um, Commissioner Purdue Dolan, I just wanted to let you know also that this spring, uh, the ladies are working on a grant to focus on uh, Irish history in Butte, as well as how that ties to one of the previous owners of the chateau. So it's just all, all a component of that. So be looking forward to that and we'll keep you posted on those developments too. So thank you. And if I can just say one thing, I have 25 years of experience with um, educational outreach, youth outreach with at-risk youth and all kinds of youth ranging from rural environments to very urban environments. And um, Commissioner, the, the pieces that you pulled out have to do with um, working with kids and getting them um, different ways of, of uh, getting them to think and a series of it's 25 years of training so you pulled out some very specific things that um actually are pedagogical um so i just wanted to it uh, has to do with how how we educate how theories of education so um i just wanted to add that so thank you very much okay thank you Next item on the agenda is public comment on any items that are on the agenda. Is there any member of the public that would like to speak on any items that's on the agenda? Mr. Harris, please state your name and uh, address for the record. Chris Harris, 820 West Galena, Commissioner Morgan, members of the council. I'm here in support of the applicant on communication 15393 in uh, asking you to overturn the recommendations of the Historic Preservation Commission, which happens to be an advisory body only. Um, just for the record, this is, a, this is private property and this is a private investment. There is no public money involved in this. The consensus on this is not whether the, whether the structure ought to be demolished, the, the rub is in the, in, in the requirements to issue the demolition permit. So I will get back to that in a minute, but for right now, I wanna focus on an economic argument. And my contention is this type of investment is the perfect form of, econo of economic development for Butte Silverbow. In this case, this applicant purchased three lots. He's gonna demolish a blighted property at his own expense. We have property which right now is worth about $10,000. He's going to make an investment, private investment, that's going to turn this into something that's going to be taxed now at in between $150,000 and $200,000. He's using existing infrastructure, which he connects to at his own expense. We're talking about money which is spent locally here at Triple S, ProBuild, Pioneer Concrete, et cetera. This is absolutely what we want. We want someone to come here. We want someone to buy a blighted property. If it can't be rehabilitated, 
again, we have consensus. We want them to get rid of it and we want them to make an investment. We have all of the ingredients here for a win-win situation for, any, for everyone. Now, one of the requirements that the Historic Preservation Commission and the Historic Preservation Officer made was that his, the replacement structure would conform to National Park Service standards. Now, just last year, two years ago, National Affordable Housing did a project down on West Granite Street. Because it was federal money, they had to conform to the National Park Service standards. Now, I was at a public meeting where Missy Resilian said, we're really, really happy with the architectural elements and the way that we influence that property. We think it looks real good and we're, we're real happy with that. You know, that's great. But Barbara Miller's on the other side of the fence at National Affordable Housing and she's saying, well, I don't feel so good about this because you know what? I'm upside down on it. I can't get it to appraise for what I have in it. And so consequently, it's been vacant for a year. Well, where's the win? I mean, I don't get it. As Commissioner Walker will tell you from the real estate business, these properties have to appraise. They're worth what the bank says they're worth. We have to have a reasonable manner in which to address these situations. And my opinion is, is that the conditions that the Historic Preservation Commission and the Historic Preservation Officer put in place are not reasonable. And I do not think that that sends the right message for the people that we need to come here and invest in our community. This is the simplest form of economic development. We have no cash outlay here. There's only upside potential. So I would ask that you would uh, overturn those recommendations on communication 15-393, Commissioner Morgan, members of the council. Thank you. Is there any other public comment on any items that's on the agenda? Please come to the podium and state your name and address for the record. Mr. Morgan, commissioners, I'm Jean Rupert, 849 West Galena. I have two, two things I would like to present. I would like to follow Mr. Harris on this. Um, many years ago, uh, Harp Cody was going to build an insurance building on Park Avenue, Park Street. And it was supposed to be totally to hit the historic reservation. And as you know, it's just it's just a normal plain building. And um, I don't know how that happened because I was at all the meetings and it was supposed to have been designed to correlate with Uptown Butte. Um, then I was offered my house severely needed to be painted, but we didn't have the money. And um, preservation officer called me and said that they would like to donate $250 towards my paint towards the house. And I'd already gotten a bid for 30,000 and then 350 from a pre-releaser, but, um, $250. And then I asked them, I said, uh, um, if I do that, do you pick out the colors? Well, we have override on what colors you buy. That's my house. And I, so I wouldn't take the $250. I think that's an invasion. I think that you can listen to them and say, this is something that can be good and work with the people. But if it's their home or their business, nobody has a right to take that away. You know, there's already zoning laws. And I think the, uh, the man had already done his homework and did everything he was supposed to do. And then it was switched over to this week and I don't know if anybody's here from uh, the preservation because that's the reason they switched it over to this week. But anyway, that's my st statement for there. Now, can I have another statement for a different one? Yes. Okay. Um, section 15, communication 15391. Uh, Cindy Perdudola and uh, requesting council's approval of the resolution that will fulfill a 
a current ordinance regarding central purchasing. I've been fighting this for years. I was on the study commission that brought this up and it was voted on by the people to do this. And um, I'm kind of a hoarder on some things. I still have all the uh, paperwork for Southwestern Montana Fairplex. I also have all the paperwork for uh, 20 years ago on the study commission. So I can prove, but you already have the ordinance. It's already there that it shouldn't be kicked down anymore. You shouldn't have to vote on anything except for getting it started. It's uh, a place where this is where we start not believing in our, our political people because it was voted on, it was supposed to be done, and it hasn't been done, and they keep kicking it down. So please, we want to get, I want to get the police back to where I can trust the people we vote for to do what they say and how they vote. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other public comment? Please come to the podium and state your name and address for the record. My name is Rick Tilstra, um, 110 Kearney Lane, Sheridan, Montana. I, I guess this is the time I have to come to speak. I, I've never been to one of these meetings before. Rick, I, I would just interrupt you. When when we get to this communication, I, I, I will call on you at okay. that time for your All testimony. Right. I just didn't want to miss out in case. You'll have the opportunity to speak. Any other, Cameron, do you want to? Uh, I would just like to emphasize that when it comes to this 208 South Washington Street property, um, my proposal is the one that uh, plans on preserving that middle structure, whereas my opponents on it, they plan on demolishing it. Um, I know it'll be a lot to repair that structure, but it's designed to be very useful to me. Um, also, I'd like to emphasize that my proposals, uh, well, I, as opposed to my opponents on it, Todd Brown and Jade Wetmore. Uh, mine, I've got the cash to pay for it, or they would have to be taking out a loan to do it. And there's their proposal is much more drastic. And I just feel that mine has a much more has a much better chance of actually succeeding. And these properties have a much better chance of uh, being where they're supposed to be in a year with my plan. And I'd like to invite any questions if anybody has any. Mr. Moylan, at this time, we can't ask any questions, but if Thank the commissioners you. do have any, they can they can contact you directly from your contact information. Okay. Please state your name and um, address for the record. Butch Gerbrandt. One more time. Butch Gerbrandt, 412 West Broadway. And that puts me in the vicinity of both the Archito and the property uh, at uh, 523 West Broadway. And I'd like to briefly address both those issues. Uh, uh, I live in the next block and across the street from the Archito, and I attended a number of their sessions this, this uh, summer and uh, really, really enjoyed them. Uh, one in particular, one of the interns did a historical comparison of the Archito and a building just two doors down from me and sort of historically matched what was going on in those two different buildings. And I found it very interesting and enlightening. So I really, uh, really want to thank the organization that put on the, the sessions there at the Archito. The other issue I would like to address is, let me get the number here, uh, communication 15393. And again, I'm interested in this because this is in my neighborhood, um, one block down and on the other side of the street. I might just say that the reason why Mr. Uh, Tilstra has run up against, I guess, uh, regulations and uh, monitoring is that he is proposing to destroy the structure, to take it down. If he had decided to just remodel it, uh, he would have been free using his own money to do whatever he wanted there. So to just uh, a little note there, I as a neighbor trust the city, county, and the organizations involved to protect the historic nature 
of my neighborhood and and the the 300 and 400 and 500 uh, blocks of Broadway are just really great architectural treasures and uh, I really depend on the county and its planning staff and historic officer to protect that feeling to the neighborhood and so I'm all for them to continue doing that. Thank you. Thank you. Please state your name and address for the record. Good evening, everybody. My name is Noor Jahan Parwana. I live at 125 West Copper Street. Uh, like uh, Mr. Gerbrandt, I would like to comment on the same two issues. I heard the presentation tonight about the root and bloom. I too went to several of their events and art walks <clears throat> and what a treasure to this community. What a treasure to the children. How wonderful to have an opportunity to have humanities and art brought to our community. Um, anyway, I, it, for me, it was a wonderful thing and I hope you will support their efforts in every possible way. And I like being stretched in my vocabulary and, and understanding. Pedagogy, I now know what that means. <laughs> Um, the other issue that I would like to uh, comment on, on behalf of Butte CPR, and definitely not as articulately as many of our uh, Butte CPR members would do, but I'll do the best I can, um, and it's related to communication 15-393. Um, I was at the meeting on August 4, 2015 of the Historic Preservation Commission. The owner of the building at 523 West Broadway brought a demolition request to the Historic Preservation Commission and it was my understanding at the meeting that he was contemplating replacing the building with a duplex. The Historic Preservation Commission supported the request with the condition that he provide a plan for a new building so that its design can be reviewed by the uh, historic preservation for compatibility with the historic neighborhood. Now, it has been shown time and time again, and if you would like Butte CPR to come make a presentation uh, about it, we could uh, talk about how historic preservation is an economic benefit to our community. Um, and. Uh, uh, so the Historic Preservation Commission has, is required to maintain a very minimum standard, uh, a nod toward historic preservation uh, and maintaining the character of our communities, uh, of our neighborhoods, which is very important. On a personal level, I live just down the street from a building that was torn down. It's a big hole in the ground. It's been a big hole in the ground for the past couple of years. I hope that when the developer of that property uh, goes to uh, build something on that site that the Historic Preservation Commission will ask that that person maintain a certain level of a certain standard that will um, at least be a nod toward quality and toward recognizing the historic character of my uh, neighborhood, which is a working class neighborhood. Um, so, so the owner asked to demolish the building. The Historic Preservation Commission supported that with a contingency that he provide a plan for the duplex that he said he was going to construct. That's not an onerous request. The uh, Historic Preservation uh, Commission uh, provided the property owner nine months to come up with that design. In his letter, I noticed in the communication, the owner identifies a, a property boundary adjustment as the goal for the property. That's a little different from what I heard at the Historic Preservation Commission. Um, if a property boundary adjustment is the desired goal, then a design is moot. And, and I don't understand why the property owner would ask to have you overturn the decision of the Historic Preservation Commission. If his goal is to build a building, then please, we have very talented, thoughtful 
professional people on the Historic Preservation Commission. Their job is to review exactly these kinds of projects. I don't think any of them are um, outrageously difficult people uh, and they're not trying to create obstacles. They're just trying to help us maintain a standard for our community. I don't remember if it was Mr. Henderson or Mr. Fisher last week that pointed to out a house in the photographs that he said, well, what kind of a house is this? This doesn't meet historic standards. Well, that's why the Historic Preservation Commission would like to at least have an opportunity to review those documents so that those, the design, so that we meet a very basic minimum standard. Um, so, due to CPRS, the council reject the appeal and support the Historic Preservation Commission's recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Please come up to the podium and state your name and address for the record. <clears throat> um, Chairman and Council of Commissioners, my name is Melody Rice and my address is 415 West Broadway. I too speak um, um, in favor of, uh, or uh, want to speak about those two topics that um, Mer Jahan and Butch have spoken about. Um, I was one of the presenters at the Root and Bloom program this year, and I speak in favor, high favor, for continuing our support as a community for this program. And the reasoning is, as far as I know, it's the only program that advocates intergenerational connection. And so um, for me, intergenerational connection is paramount. And the reason for that, I'm a licensed clinical professional counselor and I'm a bereavement counselor. And one of the things that we as adults know that uh, teens and young adults aren't um, as experienced at is experiencing loss. And our youth has had a tremendous degree of loss in the last few years. And I believe that the Root and Bloom is one of those places where this interfacing of wisdom can happen um, uh, in a, in a rich and colorful way. And uh, so I speak in favor of continuing uh, support on that for the Root and Bloom, Bloom um, project. Also, I live in that neighborhood and I love walking home from work and seeing, today I saw people um, from, uh, in costumes that were from the um, turn of the century. So there's action and activity and richness bubbling in that building that is just beautiful as uh, being a neighbor. I also speak uh, on the topic, um, the communication 15393. I live um, a s several doors down, three doors down, and I do not want to see a parking lot there. I don't think that that would be um, uh, in integral or uh, aesthetically pleasing to our neighborhood. And it's a wonderful neighborhood. I absolutely love it. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on to section four. Um, communication number 15-251, Henry and, and Colleen Klobuchar, 220, or 2221 South Main Street, Butte, Montana, requesting council's authorization to purchase county-owned property under the adjacent land owner policy. We'll continue to hold this one in abeyance. I did talk to Rob Makarowski today and we are just waiting on the resolution to be introduced to council, which should be at our next regular um, council meeting is what he told me today. Section five, communication number 15-264, Francis P. McGee, 125 West Granite Street, Butte, Montana, requesting council work with the residents in the Clarks Park area to enforce noise uh, restrictions prohibitions against fault in the park and enforce the 10 p.m. closure time. I would refer to Commissioner McDonough for an update. Thank you, Chairman Morgan. Um, this last week we've had correspondence with the county attorney, um, uh, Public Works Director, Mr. Schultz, and Park and Rec Director, J.P. Gallagher, in regards to this communication. There's been uh, an ongoing discussion for the better part of two years as to what's a lot and what's not. Um, so we are currently meeting again next week to review maybe some potential options. Uh, however, 
um, both the county attorney and the park and rec um, under the previous director uh, deemed that fall was an allowable activity in the park. So I don't think that's changed, but we're gonna confirm that. Uh, Sheriff Lester is committed to enforcing the 10 o'clock closure time. And uh, as far as the noise restrictions, we are gonna meet. However, the supporting documents of the splash pad bid don't support there, there was no obligation that we can find that said that they were going to build noise restriction or um, add amenities to, to curb the noise uh, during the operation of the splash pad. So still ongoing, but we'll report back. I ask that we hold it in advance. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner McDonough. Um, moving on to section six, communication number 15-334. Robert A. Makarowski, Director, Butte Silver Bow Land Office, requesting council ask the Community Development Department to prepare and issue developers packets for 208 South Washington and 821 Highland Avenue. As you guys know, those developer packets have been issued. So at this time, I would ask that this communication be cross-referenced with communication number 15-357. Commissioner Walker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would like to this time make a motion to cross-reference uh, communication 15-34 communication 15-357 and place on file second motion made and seconded just a correction to the motion the communication is 15-334 instead of 34 um, is there anything on the question all those in favor Aye. all those opposed Seeing none, motion passes. <laughs> Section seven, communication number 15-356, Kenneth and Michelle Palmer, 936 Zarelda Street, Butte, Montana, requesting council's authorization to purchase county-owned property under the adjacent landowner policy. Again, we will continue to hold this one in abeyance as the land sales committee is still reviewing this. Section eight, communication number 15-357, Karen Burns, Director of Butte Silver Bow Community Development Department, requesting council's authorization to hold a public hearing on August 26th, 2015, regarding the developer packets uh, proposals for 208 South Washington and 821 Highland Avenue. We did hold this uh, public hearing tonight, so Commissioner Walker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, at this time, I'd like to make a motion to place communication number 15-357 on file. Second. There's been a motion made and seconded to place communication number 15-357 on file. Anything on the question? All those in favor? Aye. Uh, all those opposed? Hearing none, motion passes. Section nine, communication number 15-358, Brendan McDonough, Butte Silver Bow Commissioner, District number eight, requesting a review of zoning ordinance regarding the keeping of horses on property within the city limits. I would refer to Commissioner McDonough. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd just like to hold this in abeyance until we all hear back from the planning department in regards to this communication. Okay. <laughs> Section 10, communication number 15-359. Lori Casey, Assistant Planning Director, Butte Silver Bowl Planning Board, requesting council approve zoning application number 172 and ask for an ordinance to be prepared adopting the proposed change. This was in our Judiciary Committee meeting tonight, so I would refer to Commissioner Walker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, at this time, I would uh, make a motion to cross-reference communication number 15-359 with Council Bill 15-12, Ordinance 15-12, and place on file. Second. Motion made and seconded to cross-reference communication 15-359 with council bill number 15-12 and ordinance 15-12 in place on file. Are there any questions? All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Seeing none, motion passes. Section 11, communication number 15-362 David Schultz, Director of Butte Silver Bow Public Works Department, requesting council's authorization to hold a public hearing on August 19th, 2015, regarding revising sections of the municipal code or code relative to solid waste collection and recycling services. We held this presentation last week, so Commissioner Walker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At this time, I make a motion to place communication 15-362 on file. Second. 
Motion made and seconded to place communication 15-362 on file. Anything on the question? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. Let the record reflect Commissioner Henderson and Commissioner Fisher opposed. Motion passes. Section 12, communication number 15-366, Dan Dennehy, Director, Emergency Management Agency, requesting council's authorization to hold a bid opening on August 26, 2015, regarding maintenance and repair of U Silver Bow radios and electro electronic equipment at the 911 center. We did hold this um, bid opening tonight. Um, County Attorney Joyce, do we just place this communication on file and wait for the next one? Commissioner, County Attorney Joyce. Mr. Chairman, yes. Okay. Commissioner Walker. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, at this time, I would make a motion to place communication 15-366 on file. Second. Motion made and seconded to place communication 15-366 on file. Are there any questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Hearing none, motion passes. Section 13, communication number 15-368, J.P. Gallagher, Director of Butte Silver Bow Parks and Recreation Department, requesting council's authorization to hold a bid opening on August 19th, 2015, regarding the construction of the grandstand for Miners Field at Copper Mountain Sports Complex. We did hold this bid opening on August 19th, so Commissioner Walker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, at this time, with, I would like to make the motion to place communication Number 15-368 on file. Second. There's been a motion made and seconded to place communication number 15-368 on file. Is there anything on the question? All those in favor? Aye. Uh, All those opposed? Nay. Let the record reflect uh, Commissioner Purdue Dolan was a nay. Motion passes. Section 14, communication number 15-385. Nicole Ivankovic, Assistant Director, Archives, requesting council's authorization for a presentation to be given on the, on the Root and Bloom program on August 26, 2015. We did hold this, this presentation, so Commissioner Walker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At this time, I would like to make the motion to place on file communication number 15-385. Second. There's been a motion made and seconded to place communication number 15-385 on file. Is there anything on the question? All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Hearing none, motion passes. Section 15, communication number 15-391. Cindy Purdue Dolan, Butte Silver Bow Commissioner, District Number 1, requesting council's approval of a resolution that will fulfill a current Butte Silver Bow ordinance regarding central purchasing of office supplies within Beat Silver Bow City and County Government. I would refer to Commissioner Purdue Dolan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I wanted to uh, push this to the Committee of the Whole from the budget process that we have just finished. And my first question is to our county attorney to uh, ask about the 1997 ordinance that was passed following the Butte Silver Bow Study Commission and this has been sitting pretty much on the books since 1997 and we haven't really moved on this and just wanting to ask you what we do if this has just been sitting on the books, I guess, uh, being passed by the voters in ordinance form, but just sitting there, I County guess is my question. Attorney Joyce. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Purdue Dolan, um, I looked at the ordinance that uh, was passed in 1997 and it, it um, created a city county administrative code that allowed for the establishment of regulations regarding procurement and central purchasing, supervision and discipline of personnel, safety, capital improvements, and other regulations. Um, I think during the time since this ordinance was passed, there have been certain um, provisions that have been passed related to um, policies on supervision and discipline of 
personnel, some safety regulations, and also some procurement um, provisions and some aspects of central purchasing in that we have adopted um, the cooperative purchasing uh, provisions of the state procurement law, which does allow us to purchase um, materials or supplies um, through the state's um, competitive bid processes. Um, so I think in terms of your request for a resolution, um, I would need to know what types of central purchasing um, you would want to um, look into having be developed. And so I'd need a little more information on developing a resolution as in particular, what type of um, things you want to have central purchasing and whether we would have to um, look at whether that would require additional staffing or, you know, an additional department within Butte Silver Bow to manage a central purchasing type of process. Um, so it, I just think there's more um, detail that needs to be looked into and perhaps um, a discussion by some type of a committee that could be formed to develop a process that you would want to bring back before the full council. Commissioner Purdue Dolan. Thank you, County Attorney. Uh, I, um, sorry, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I agree. Uh, I think that is is uh, good, and uh, I agree with being on the Finance and Budget Committee for uh, seven months. I found uh, the office supplies across the board were extremely high in cost, and I think buying in bulk, like school district number one here in Butte makes really good sense. And I think we can make, uh, we don't have to reinvent the wheel uh, and that could save the taxpayers a lot of money. Um, we could possibly work with them or find out and partner with them, uh, find out about their warehousing. We certainly have the buildings here in Uptown Butte uh, we could possibly use and find out about their distribution of supplies. So uh, I agree uh, maybe coming up with uh, a committee in the short term uh, to, to work on this. And uh, I spoke with Commissioner Shaw uh, last week to, uh, to move this forward and to move forward on this uh, quickly. I understand that you know, this, this was the ordinance, but I think there is work to do. Uh, talk with Commissioner Anderson, and uh, I just feel that um, maybe right now we can um, uh, hold this in abeyance and, uh, and just, I just really hope that across the board with these departments that we can um, move on this central purchasing to to have these supplies from paper to pencils to, to really everything that Butte Silver Bow as a county purchases mirror what Butte Silver Bow's um, school district number one does to just save the, the taxpayer money in essence. Thank you. Are there any other commissioners that have any questions? The, the one question that I would have, Commissioner Purdue Dolan, is would you see this being an opportunity? Would, I guess, would you have to have somebody staff this? How would, how would you fund it? Who would maintain it? Where would it be maintained? I know in theory this, this sounds easy, but I don't think it's something that cannot be managed by somebody. So, Commissioner Purdue Dolan. Absolutely. Um, that is, and as we found in the budget process, my amendment to freeze hiring was shot down in a, in a flame. Um, it was not, um, it was not frozen. Um, however, there are uh, so many employees and, and I think we could find one that is, um, versed in, in supplies that we could 
probably take from somewhere here in Butte Silver Bow that is versed in, in supplies and uh, distributing them, warehousing them, um, that has that ability, but we are going to have to find someone to do it, as was um, mentioned by Commissioner Anderson a month or two ago. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Fisher. Thank you, Chairman Morgan. Um, as you know, when I first got on this commission, that was one of my kind of things I went through, and Commissioner Foley and I, he was the chairman of the budget and finance. The purchasing of just office supplies isn't sufficient enough. You got to have where you have a purchasing department that buys expendable and consumable items, and you have to have a warehousing program, which the school district does. This is a good idea, but it needs a lot more research before it's implemented. And I am willing to go the extra mile and help with this. I do have a lot of warehousing experience and purchasing experience and things like that. But to implement this without the proper planning would be a disaster. So I really think that it's a great idea, but we wanna make sure that we do a little prior proper planning before this happens. Thank you. <laughs> with that being said, I would piggyback off that and, and ask Commissioner Purdue Dolan to to start conversations with the county attorney and other and probably the chief executive so that you can propose a plan to this body so that we actually have something that we can vote on. Commissioner Foley. Thank you. Um, just a couple comments. Um, first off, I think that uh, you know, I'm certainly open to, to look at any proposal, uh, but this obviously is just a starting point. You know, the one of the first things I'd like to be able to establish is that it, it keeps on being said that this will save the county money. Well, I think we need to establish that first, and I don't think that's been done. Uh, in fact, I don't have any numbers in front of me exactly what we do pay in terms of office supplies. Um, I think there probably is a little difference between that and the school district, but I'm certainly willing to look at that. Uh, but, you know, just to present an argument that, uh, you know, this will automatically save us money without having that data, I think is premature. Um, the other issue here, and, and I say this for the sake of Commissioner Fisher, who often in those budget meetings, um, he used to be bothered by the fact that uh, we had items that were purchased out of Butte, particularly cars and vehicles. Um, keep in mind, and I caution you, if we go down this road, there's a, probably a high percentage chance that items that and purchased in bulk will not be purchased in Butte, Montana. Um, so I would urge you to take a look at that as well when you look at that. And that's something that uh, I, I have no idea uh, if the 1997, I wasn't on the council at the time, neither of us, and none of us were, uh, but what, what was the reasoning for that? Uh, maybe those two issues were looked at. Uh, maybe it wasn't going to save us a lot of money, and maybe the local merchants uh, and office supply people in Butte uh, probably opposed it for that reason. I have no idea. But I would I ask you to please, you know, uh, before we proceed with this, to, to come with more information and numbers. Thank you. <laughs> Any other comments? I'm assuming that we want to hold this one in advance. Commissioner Anderson? I would just make a, my, my thoughts on this from the get-go is that uh, whenever you buy anything or any services in bulk, you're, you're going to save money than buying them piecemeal. Uh, however, when you, I think the biggest thing we have to do with this is like everyone was saying is go to the school district I think would be the best thing because we can see how they do it. They have a good program that's obviously working for them over there. Uh, it's a similar entity in uh, some forms, kind of quite a bit different in others. But I think that gives us a great uh, jumping off point and starting point and uh, work with them to see how they do it, how it goes about and what services and everything you provide. Uh, if we did have to, and what it costs them to maintain and operate the program, we would save money, but would that money we save be justifiable expense when we're looking at staffing warehouses with people and uh, people to handle the workload? So there's an awful lot of different situations that must be done. So I think just uh, putting this in the suspense file for a few months until some of these questions can be answered would be preferable. Is that in the form of a motion, Commissioner? Uh, yes. I've moved to place this in the suspense file for three months, waiting reports on the uh, necessary peoples and uh, to get the procedures done and then take another look at it then. 
uh, should give adequate time. Second. There's been a motion made and seconded to hold this communication, 15-391, um, in the suspense file for three months, and then we will revisit it. Um, on the question, I, I would ask just one question, and, and I don't really expect an answer, but we're saying that the school district is is working well. How, how are we comparing that? What's our what's our benchmarks? How, how are we saying it's being ran well if we really don't know? Commissioner Anderson, then I'll, I'll go to Commissioner Purdue. Well. They've been following the same policy for a number of years, so I imagine it's working for them instead of each individual school buying the uh, textbooks. It's, like I said, it's a lot more uniform what they need. Every grade school needs the same textbooks for the same first grade class the same textbooks for the same uh, fifth grade class. So the what Whittier Elementary buys uh, is very similar to what West Elementary would buy, what Kennedy would buy. The high school obviously is, they're all gonna use pencils, they're all gonna use pens, they're all gonna use copiers. Uh, we use those same services. So if we can get on board with having the same toner cartridges. So instead of spending $75, we can spend 50, would save that money. And I believe that's what the school district is doing. I, I guess only numbers will tell though. We have to we have to look at numbers to compare anything. So Absolutely. Commissioner Purdue Dolan. Um, I'd like to make a substitute motion where I'm just gonna come back with a different communication where I could uh, make uh, different, uh, a more substantial communication where it's more inclusive of central purchasing uh, with including more than just office supplies. Thank you. So if I'm understanding this correctly, you would make a motion to place this communication, communication on, on file. file. Okay. Motion made and seconded by Commissioner Henderson to place communication number 15-391 on file. Is there anything on the question? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Hearing none, motion passes. Section 16, communication number 15-393. Rick Tilstra, Tilstra Construction, requesting an appeal of a decision made by the Historic Preservation Commission regarding 523 West Broadway Street. Before I ask Mr. Tisla or Tistra to come to the podium, I just want to make it known that last week he was instructed to, he did, he was not required to be at the council meeting, so that's why he wasn't here. Had he been instructed to be here, he would have. So, Mr. Tilstra, I would ask you to come to the podium and and talk about your your communication good evening mr chairman members of the council wow uh, i'm a little taken back i you know i, I bought this property I, i've had three properties in butte that i fixed up and um met neighbors that i became friends with uh Real estate people loved it because they listed them and sold them. And I bought this one thinking I would do the same. And um, after looking at it closer and further and longer, I come to the conclusion that it was just strictly going to be a money pit. And so I thought, well, I think maybe the thing to do is to, to put money into something new instead of just throwing money into something old that I can't recoup. And I think it's quite evident um, that the structure probably should come down. Um, there's really not a lot going for it from the foundation up, period. And the thing that amazes me is this whole historical context talk is we're talking about a rectangle box with no eaves, no window treatments, no architectural design other than a two and a half foot porch that is good for nothing and each replaced. And I'm like, I don't get it. I, I'm trying to clean the neighborhood up, really. And I'm gonna be so far underwater by the time I do it, and I'm being 
said, no, no, you, it's not quite so easy. We, you may not be able to do that. And I, I just don't understand it. Uh, historic standards, the, that whole part of it, it's like there's, there's nothing to look at there. And we have a mixed neighborhood that has a large brick apartment to one side of it, an open lot that I own alongside of it that you can drive off the street and park on because there's a curb there, so you can park on it. You know, if you don't like parking lots, well, so be it. You could park there and make the parking lot anyway. If the neighbors haven't cluttered up the street, and you can get at it. But I honestly, I I'm sort of just uh, I, I'm sort of amazed. Honestly, I I think that um, if you want to improve the town, you've got to work with people a little bit. You can't. I'm trying to demolish something that's going to help, but I'm being asked to spend money on plans to be approved before I can even get to that process. And I don't think that's right. And even what they're asking for is to come up with something that was going to look good there. That's not what's there now. It's a masonite sided box. But what they would like to see is something that looks like the 1890s to 1920s, which I probably would do because I want to build, if I'm going to build something, I would want to build something good. But they're asking me to replace something and make it to their liking, even though it's not going to be like what's there now. And I, I just don't understand that logic. It just, it just befuddles me, honestly. And, and to hear, you know, neighbors come in and say, well, we, want, we love our neighborhood. We want it to stay the way it is. Hey, I was just reading this past week in the neighborhood, but not my neighborhood here in Broadway, but on 2nd Street, they had issues with people squatting. Well, this house has been vacant for over a year. I paid three years of delinquent taxes when I bought it. 2800 bucks in delinquent taxes. I think that's more of a favor than a detriment to the county. And yet now I'm being asked to put money out to do something just to erase something that I, I think and I think that most people would agree needs to come down. And I don't think I don't think that that's the correct process. And I don't think you're going to I would say this, though, I will promise you that I will not buy another demolition project in this town in, in the historic area. I will promise you that because I learned a whole lot and I was naive, obviously. But um, I, I would not care. I, I mean, rebuild, remodel, fine, but uh, demo, I'm done. And that's that's just how I feel about it. Okay. Any questions? Any uh, commissioners have any questions for Mr. Tilstra? Commissioner Fisher? Thank you, Chairman. I really don't have any questions, but as I stated last week, you know, the process and procedure has been followed. And he wasn't here last week, but had you been here last week, I'd give you the same speech. He's followed the process and procedure. It's now before us to make a decision whether he gets to demolish that building or not. And we can't pass the buck no more. It's a decision we got to make, and we should make it, and we shouldn't drag it out no longer. And as for what he's going to build there, I agree with him 100%. How do you know what you're going to build? Till? How do you see how that lot looks when, the sh when that shack isn't there no more and i'm sorry to call it a shack but that's what it is and listen to this man and listen to mr moylan from bozeman we're in butte silver bow these people have been coming here wanting to develop property in our town and we're putting the run on it people we got to wake up a little bit if we want people to come in here and spend money and develop town and build we've got to start making decisions and following policy and procedure as he stated he went through the gauntlet to get where he's at here tonight and i think we should allow him to demolish that building and then decide what he would like to build on that property. Thank you. Any other commissioners have any questions? Ms. McCormick, do you have any is a staff report?
That's the Ms. McCormick. Thank you, Chairman Morgan and members of the commission. I'm Mary McCormick. I'm the Historic Preservation Officer. As you know, I'm kind of new in this position, so I would like you to humor me a little bit, and I would like to just kind of discuss um, how this decision was made. And to do that, I'd like to first refer you to the Historic Preservation Ordinance. It's the first um, item in your packet. I just copied off the portion of the ordinance, and this is the ordinance, the revised ordinance that was passed by this group last January. Um, page 32 starts on the demolition request review program and the process that you go through. Um, and that basically the, what it says is if you have a historic property and um, that it has to go through design, demolition, if you and request a demolition permit, the permit has to come to the Historic Preservation Commission for review. And in this case, the house at 523 West Broadway is a contributing element of the landmark district. And so it did come to the, does go to the commission for review. If you go on though to page 11, which is kind of in the back there, I apologize, I got them a little out of order. Um, when something comes to review, and, the, and in this case, the commission decided that to approve the um, permit, the demolition request, but with conditions, and that's the appropriate procedure. If you look at item L on page, starting at L on page 11, it says demolition conditions mean actions that may apply to the conditional approval of a demolition request, including one, the first is documentation, two, the second is, or, is salvage, and three is site redevelopment plan. And there it states that the owner will be required to submit to the HPC a design review certificate of appropriateness for any new building or structures proposed for construction on the site. So in actuality, the Historic Preservation Commission was following the mandates of the ordinance when they requested Mr. Tilstra to present plans for a new building that he proposed for construction at this site. And accordingly, the intent of us review of the commission reviewing those plans is to make sure that the new building is going to be what we call compatible in design with the historic character of the neighborhood. And that's what we're really trying to protect here is the historic character of this very important neighborhood in our extremely important landmark district. There have been lots of studies done in the last few years on all kinds of planning and um, well, tourism studies that have directly and indirectly touched on preservation and the issue of compatibility of design in our historic district. And I'd like to refer to you to your next attachment, which should be the Silver Bow County Growth Policy of 2008. If you open it up, I copied the page on cultural resources. And if you go at the top, it says key findings. It's on the um, right hand side. And it says many of Butte's nationally significant historic resources are threatened due to the first one is the loss of population and associated decay in the urban core. And the second is the lack of design review for proposed renovation and infill construction in the landmark district. It also notes that Butte's historic properties are key to the redevelopment of our community. Your next um, handout is Butte Montana Copperway, an action plan for historic for heritage tourism in the Butte Anaconda Heritage Corridor. And that was produced in 2012. If you go back on page 76, the thing that I would just like to highlight there is what was said about design. It said, um, the rec they're giving recommendations for good 
historic heritage tourism in the Copperway corridor. This recommendation is to send a signal to private investors that their investment in historic Butte will be respected. Reinforce existing historic preservation regulatory programs, the 2007 Historic Preservation Ordinance and Guidelines and the Butte Historic Preservation Commission to signal private investors that their investment in historic buildings will not be undermined by blight or remodeling of neighboring buildings or inappropriate new construction. So I think in Butte Silver Bow, we've made a lot of good headway lately, incompatible in design, and we're starting to see the benefits of that. I had a few slides that I wanted to show you, but you know, it, of, of compatible design, but it's getting kind of late. So I think that I'll, I'll uh -huh. um, not go into that right now. But I also wanted to show you photographs of this historic neighborhood. It is a very mixed historic neighborhood, and that's part of its character. But it's but it, it's. It's got small workers' cottages combined with, you know, great, huge Queen Anne Victorian architecture. And that's the real character of historic Uptown Butte. And that's one of the great things about this lot that Mr. Tilstra owns. If you're going to build a new building there, there are so many good options for what we call compatible design. He could build something small, like the little, there's a group of three little hip roof cottages from the 1890s that are across the street. He can mimic that design or draw on that design. There's, you know, the bigger Queen Anne's with fish scale shingling, you know, he could draw on that design. He could draw on the design of the um, brick apartment buildings that are in the area as well. There's just a lot to work with. The commission, when they made this decision, they directed Mr. Tilstra to work with me. I'm not an architect, but I'm an, historic, I'm an architectural historian. I've done compatible design review and um, comments for 30 years on all kinds of projects in Butte, across Montana, and most recently for the Army Corps of Engineers while I worked for them in their Seattle district. It's something I'm very familiar with. You know, I was hoping that it's it's hard for me to imagine that somebody puts up a house without any plans. And, you know, I'm, I'm the daughter of an engineer who built houses on the side, and I can remember plans all over our living room. I was hoping that Mr. Tilster can maybe bring some plans in, and we could work together on coming up with something. And it's, you know, it doesn't have to be an arduous process, but at as new construction, compatible construction, for example, the um, archives, the new addition onto the archives, what it has shown is what a difference when you have compatible design. That's why that building looks so great and it feels, fits so well in our historic district. You can say the same for um, Northwestern's new building. It's big, but if you look at the historic photographs of the building that it replaced that was there before the historic, I can't remember what its name was, but it was a big building. It fills that lot, but it also replicates the strong, sturdy construction of the uptown with that great red brick, the fine materials that were used, the um, copper shingles, but it's also a modern design. And that's one thing that is that you want to do when you do compatible design is blend the old with the new. So anyway, I don't think the I think this commission, they take their job very seriously. Um, I think they are committed to be committed for the great public service and the time that they dedicate to this. They're a really great bunch of people. They're, you know, they're well-educated, well-meaning. They all care about Butte and they all care about the uptown. A couple of them are here tonight and I'd just like to introduce you to them. We have Bob McCarthy, our former county attorney, and Mr. Steve Hennig, a longtime architect in Butte. They were two of the six that debated on this, this proposal. The whole group was unanimous in their feeling that the house at 523, because of its condition, could not be preserved and should be demolished but they also were unanimous and it was the only thing that was discussed as a condition was that 
Mr. Tilstra bring his designs to the HPC for review. And they directed him initially to talk to me about working with him in and getting some appropriate designs. It means a lot to that neighborhood. It's a great neighborhood and people in that neighborhood that own historic homes like um, Mr. Gilbrandt, they have invested a lot of money into their homes and I think they would like to see them protected and that's why we have this historic preservation officer. So I just request that you direct Mr. Tilstra to, to work with us. We would love to work with him. We would enjoy working with him and I think we can come up with something that would make everybody happy. Thank you. Thank you. I, I guess the only comment that I would make, um, the, the problem that I'm having with this is we have a developer here that wants to tear down to demolish a building, which that is not being questioned here. You guys agreed that it was to be demolished. You have a developer here that wants to put up a new structure. And, and to be quite frank, regardless what he puts up there is going to look better than what is there now. I mean, I mean, depending on looking at his past projects that he's done and, and some of the, the work that, I mean, what he's, what he's looking to do. Um, I, I think it's, it's something, but you know, he, he is following the process and, and I do agree with your guys' preservation board. I would just, I would rather not see us deny him this and then he's just going to leave that structure there. And that's just going to be another eyesore that we're going to have to deal with later down the road. Um, I know Commissioner Palmer has a question and Commissioner Fisher and then Commissioner Henderson. So Commissioner Palmer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, we're reading the ordinance. I don't believe it says that it has to have design review prior to demolition, but is there a problem with us allowing the demolition contingent upon him working with you in your office with design review on a new building? Should he, put one up after the demolition has taken place. I understand, I think that the, the commission asked that he come up with a design review on a new building prior to demolition. And I just don't think that the ordinance calls for that. I think that it calls for some design review and working with it on a new building for the infill afterwards. But um, I, I would like to see it happen that way, allow him to demolish the building and then before he puts up a new one, but it gives him time. I, I hate to have him come up in the middle of winter and try to demolish the building. I think that, you know, if he was allowed to do it, but then work with your office and the, uh, the commission on a little bit of design review to get something that everybody's happy with. I could go along with that. Just a comment. Commissioner, oh, Commissioner Henderson. Mr. Chairman. Um, I have some serious problems with this. I, uh, I'm not educated in historic preservation. I'd love to see what I see in Butte and, and we're trying to preserve it and stuff. But when you've got a house like this that we're looking at and, and the people, um, neighbors, they've all had a chance to purchase this home. Uh, this gentleman, he wants to purchase it or he purchased it and wants to tear it down and rebuild uh, whatever he wants. It's his property. I, I don't get this. It's it's way beyond me that you can buy this and then you're being told you have to do this and this. As Mr. Palmer said, you know, we could look at the one way where you could look at it and then work with you. I don't think he has to be doing that. I, I, I can't imagine why he can't build what he wants. It's his property. It's going to be new. If somebody wanted to build that and keep it the same or remodel it, then they should have done it. Uh, it's a brand new structure. I would think it would be an asset to build. That's my opinion. Commissioner Fisher. Uh, thank you, Chairman Morgan, and thank you for the presentation, but you know, we reviewed this historic. You didn't have to bring us and read it to us. We actually went through this for almost a year over and over and over. And there's one portion you did miss, and that's the appeal process, which comes to the Council of Commissioners. Mm -hmm. And that's where we're at in this decision right now. We're no longer in the planning. We're no longer in historic preservation. The decision now lies with the commission to decide what to do here. So everything that you've told us is correct, and I agree with it, and it's a good process and procedure. But I guess, as they say, the last rule there is 
the final decision comes after appeal from the Council of Commissioners. And that's what we're here to do tonight, is make a decision. And as much as I am hopeful that my side prevails, I respect what you're doing and gonna do in historic preservation, but we've got to think a little bit about what people are saying that coming into our town that say they will not buy another property here because we had two tonight and we only got one on a uh, on a uh, developer's packet, which a month or two, six weeks ago, we had an offer to purchase both of them and we didn't do it. So now we sold one, but we're still left with the other one. So we've really got to consider our options here. I really think that as a commission, we've got to make a decision tonight and make it final. Thank you. Commissioner Foley. Thank you. Just a couple comments, and I, I, I first off I want to state to the developer here that, you know, this is something that uh, you you question, I guess, why you go through this process. And I know it's different than probably where you work in other areas. We have a historical community, and and so we have that extra mile there. Um, I also appreciate the work of the historical commission. I mean, obviously they're doing their job. And keep a reminder that I don't know the actual vote on this ordinance that this council passed. So. Commissioner Anderson uh, did agree to, to go through this process. As Commissioner Fisher said, there is an appeal process. Um, this is not the first time there's been appeal before this council, and it won't be the last. There'll be many more. Um, I think I've told this story before, but the very first time I was on council, the very first month, the very first thing that I had a request from a constituent was to exactly what we're doing here tonight. Uh, on the end of uh, Silver Street, there was a house that he wanted to demolish, um, and he appealed it. And uh, he didn't really have any plans for it other than to improve the, that property. And if you were to go up there today, it looks beautiful. It's a beautiful yard with flowers and everything else in terms of property value, uh, that neighborhood improved dramatically. So there's a balance here, but there's also an issue what they call common sense and practicality. Um, as much as I respect their decisions here tonight, uh, that's why we are elected. Uh, the Historical Preservation Commission is, we are elected to represent the views of our constituents. Hopefully you've done that. And in, even if we don't consult with our constituents, it's the idea of using common sense. To me, a common sense saying the, the demolition will proceed and to allow this developer to proceed in what he sees fit. So I'll make a motion to approve communication 15-393, which basically allows Mr. Uh, Tilsler to uh, proceed with demolition without any conditions. Motion made and seconded to approve communication number 15-393 without any conditions. Did I get that correct, Commissioner Foley? Anything on the question? Commissioner Anderson? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Morgan, Chairman. Uh, a couple things on this. Uh, this is 500 block of Broadway. I live on the 500 block of Broadway. I live right across the street. And I have uh, taken some phone calls today, both pro and con, and I've listened to five people, also constituents of mine. Two want it torn down without any, three want it otherwise. So regardless of how it goes tonight, I'm going to piss off a few of you. So I'll apologize. So. Uh, let me just kind of state my case and hopefully you can come around to my way of thinking. Uh, the demolition conditions means actions that may, may apply. So it doesn't mean that they have to, it just means that they may. And uh, I look at the neighborhood and like I said, I live there. I walk up and down the streets pretty much every day. Uh, I live right across the street, right next to my residence. I look out my living room window and I look down and I see a playground that's in pretty rough shape. I see a school that's in uh, the old uh, Lincoln School. It's a Head Start uh, preschool now, and it's in kind of rough shape. Right directly next to me, I see a long corrugated, my phone is really small, but you can't really see it, but there's this white long structure here. It's corrugated metal. It's a corrugated metal garage, you know, it, just looks tacky. I think if you built anything above a corrugated metal garage there, I think it would be a definite improvement. I don't believe a duplex would offer that. There's many other structures, like I said. So I don't think anything that you plan on building there would do anything but improve the community. Uh, as far as the building is now, when I 
first ran for this office uh, some five years ago, there were people living in that house and they were nice enough and kind enough to invite me in for a cup of tea as a lot of other people were. Uh, Miss Rupert, for example, invites me over quite often to yell at me for one reason or another, <laughs> as do some others. But uh, when I walked into this house, you're walking down and up, the floor was waving, it's, it's cockeyed, it's, it's like Mr. Tilstra said, it would, doing work on this and trying to rehab it would be an absolute money pit. I, I firmly believe that demolishing it and just leaving a stand alone demolished, as long as it was paved, would be a definite improvement to the neighborhood. If you did not put another corrugated metal shack there, it would be even more so an improvement to the neighborhood. But I think any plans, be a craftsman or anything else, I talked to you in brief about some of your plans, and uh, I think that craftsman style duplex, like you mentioned to me, would look absolutely wonderful there. The only thing that I'd like to see is maybe some off street parking because parking right there right now is at an absolute premium. It's rather difficult. I often park across the street or in the hummingbird parking lot and try to get out of there before they get mad at me and their customers show up. But I would concur absolutely with uh, Mr. Foley's recommendation. I do hope that uh, the plans pan out and I believe that they will and I think it will be an asset to the community. So if anybody has any reservations, I would uh, put them at ease and I think that anything would be a benefit to that area. Thank you. Commissioner Palmer. Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to follow up on what Commissioner Foley said. You know, like it or not, we did pass this ordinance and it does call for a design review on any new structure. And I would go along with what I said originally, I think demolition should be allowed and he has plenty of time. He hasn't even drawn up his plan yet, I don't think, but it isn't going to hurt to have him show him to historic preservation officer. That's what the ordinance says. And they can give and take and come up with hopefully an agreement that is uh, good with both parties. <laughs> if not, the appeal process is still there for him to come back to this council and appeal that decision by the historic preservation officer and the commission. So at this time, I'll make a substitute motion that we allow the demolition to take place, but prior to any new construction that he does follow the process for design review is spelled out in the ordinance. Second. Motion made and seconded to approve the demolition of the structure, but require review of the new construction. new construction. Anything on the question? Uh, Commissioner McDonough. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a few comments. Um, I too think the structure needs to be removed and probably new development is obviously the best bet. Unfortunately, with issues like this, it's we draw the line in the sand before we meet at the table and compromise. Um, if we remember back here a few months ago, I was kicking and screaming about Robert Edwards's proposal to the corner of Park in Montana because they were gonna pitch a low cost, uh, easy construction for the building, at which point uh, Buddy Fisher, the proprietor who's taking over Taco del Sol went way above and beyond and uh, not only restored the corner to its former glory, but now it has the okay to continue it down and tear the brown plywood that we look at its sharp expressions for the last 30 years. Um, so I think there's an uptick, but I do appreciate Mr. Tilstra for coming in and investing in Butte. Um, I agree that probably anything that he puts up there is better. I do agree with the neighbors though, too, that um, I would have apprehension or reservation if I owned a home and didn't know what was going next to it, only because if you look at Belgrade, this is my example, you could build a $350,000 home here a few years ago and somebody next to you could build a pole barn. Um, so the only reason that the, the process, in my opinion, is in place is just to protect everybody's, um, to make everybody aware of what's gonna take place before it actually takes place. Um, I do congratulate Mr. Tilstra for coming over. I do think the building needs to go. 
I would ask him, uh, he pledged tonight that he would uh, put something fitting on the property and I'm gonna take his word on it. Um, and I'm gonna support the demolition. I would just ask Mr. Telstra and the Historic Preservation Commission to work together. I think that the uh, apprehension is that we're asking Mr. Telstra to put out a bunch of engineering plans and architectural plans just to come back and present them to us at a great cost or expense, which I I think that's where the rub is. And, and personally, I don't think that it is probably necessary um, to go that far, but I do have everyone's uh, side. I do concur with the demolition and I hope that we can all kind of use this as a model moving forward to compromise before we draw lines in the sand. Thanks. Any other comments, Commissioner Anderson? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Harris uh, did ask me if he could say another word on this matter, if he could be recognized. Mr. Harris. <clears throat> Chris Harris, 820 West Galena. As we got down to, thanks to Commissioner Fisher, uh, the Historic Preservation Commission is advisory and advisory only. Again, another point is because a property happens to be a contributing property, it has no legal status as it relates to demolition. None. As Ms. McCormick said, it is a mixed neighborhood, but the real rub here is, is that the people on the Historic Preservation Commission and the Historic Preservation Officer do not have an economic sense as to how these projects work. As I mentioned, the example on West Granite with National Affordable Housing, they pile the restrictions on restrictions and restrictions. Now they can't sell the property because it's upside down. Who in their right mind, if they were interested in economic development, would engage in a process that yields that result? It makes absolutely no sense to me. And for somebody to stand here and say, well, they're asking for these conditions that what we really want is economic development. It is at cross purposes. Not only that, National Affordable Housing has a number of projects that they can't sell because they're upside down. And that's the elephant in the room. And we can keep talking all around it all we want. But the fact of the matter is, is the people that are driving these discussions and are calling for these requirements do not understand the factors. You can add all these bells and whistles all you want. It's worth what the appraiser for the bank says it's worth. That's it. Chairman Morgan. Thank you. <clears throat> Commissioner Anderson. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Morgan. At this time, uh, I do see Mr. McCarthy and Mr. Hennick in the audience, and I was wondering if they had anything to add to this debate as you both served on this and uh, discussed it earlier. Just a point of order. Commissioner Foley. As much as I agree with Mr. Harris here, I don't think it's a proper procedure here. We can allow this entire place here tonight to, in the debate. I, there's, there's, there's a motion on the floor. Again, this is our council commissioners. We've had the time to allow them to discuss this. I say proceed with the vote. I don't, I don't think any more further discussion is going to change your votes. So hopefully you've made your mind up one way or another on this. I think it's only proper that we allow this. I think we shouldn't have allowed him to, to dominate the discussion because he's not relevant to this other than a citizen that's already made his point on it. Agreed, Commissioner Foley. Um, at this time, we do have a motion on the floor to um, approve the demolition of the structure and ask the developer to review the construction with with the board. Is there anything else on the question? I would ask for a roll call vote. What's that? Commissioner Fisher, do you have? I, I thought the substitute was like Commissioner Power to have a review after demolition. It was. Demolition. Correct. So the motion that we're voting on right now is to allow the demolition with review to the to the board. With review. With review. So he's approved to demo the building, but he has to have it reviewed in order before he builds. 
Is there anything on the question? Everybody voted. Would anybody like to change their vote? Would the clerk please record the vote? Four yay and five nay. So motion fails. So we go back to the first motion, which is to approve the demolition with no review of the new new project. Is there anything on the question? Again, I would ask for a roll call vote. Would the committee please vote? <coughs> Anybody like to change their vote? Would the clerk please record the vote? Eight yay and one nay. Motion passes. Moving on to section 17, communication number 15-401. Bob Marino, Bruce and Bob's good guy pawn requesting a street closure on September 2nd, 2015 to host a car show. I did uh, make a phone call today to our, our council secretary and as of today, the signatures nor the proof of insurance have been collected. This uh, event was scheduled for September 2nd, which would be during our next council meeting. So at this point, we really have no other option but to deny and place this communication on file. So I would refer to Commissioner Walker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, at this time, I would make a motion to deny and place on file communication number 15-401. Second a motion. Motion made and seconded to deny communication 15-401 and place this communication on file. Anything on the question? All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Let the record reflect Commissioner Fisher and Commissioner Anderson voted against this. Uh, motion passes. Next uh, up on our agenda is any public comment on any public matter that is not on the agenda. Again, public comment on any public matter that's not on the agenda. Mr. Banderab, please come to the podium and state your name and address for the record. Hi, Mr. Banderab, 2601 Grand Avenue. I've got a question that you can't answer, but uh, I went out at 6 o'clock uh, last night, supposedly going to the Superfund Trust Authority meeting at the Justice Department, and there wasn't any. So I appreciate somebody informing me when and where they hold their meetings. Thank you. You can later. Public, is there any other public comment? Sir, would you please come to the podium and state your name and address for the record? Yeah, um, I guess, Chairman and Commissioner, my name is uh, Edward Pape. I own Mr. Ed Salone. Uh, a lot of people call me Mr. Ed, but Hopefully this won't be too long. I don't haven't had public speech in a long time, so I hope I don't too pa go too far past my three minutes. Uh, my father, Murray Pate, God rest his soul, he managed Hennessy's in here in Uptown Butte until they closed. And uh, he taught me early in life, life's not fair. He didn't teach me how unfair it could be. <laughs> um, he loved Uptown Butte. Uh, I, don't, I don't think he'd be resting in peace if he knew what Uptown Butte is doing his son's livelihood. I've kept quiet about this for years. Obviously emotional. All these festivals, you've dumped money into a very elite group of bars in this town. You've given them so much economic power that they're shutting the bars down downtown. Can't sell them. You can't get customers in them because all the money is up here. You're dropping customers right in their lap. And what I get as a response to that is we'll get the bars together downtown and put together a festival. I shouldn't have to do that. They don't have to do it up here in Uptown Butte. So, I, I, and I know you can't respond to any of this. I read the bylaws and rules and all that, but regardless, it's, it's hurt my business extremely uh, much. And uh, I readily agree that it helps most of up to, uh, Butte, Montana's business. You know, restaurants, uh, motels, well, now it's great for them, and I agree. And I'm a very small percentage, and I understand that. But for my own health and well-being, I need to get this off my chest. Basically, I know U.S. law, with very few exceptions, they, they keep companies from you know getting together and striking deals to curtail competition. It's the law. 
you know, I don't know if this government has laws like that, but that's basically what's going on. You basically got a powerhouse of very few individuals that own bars uptown now, or near the uptown districts, that pretty much can run roughshod. I weathered the storm for years, just in the summer. But you give them so much economic power now, it affects me year round. And, and that's just a fact. Um, I mean, I've talked to a lot of others about this and getting it off my chest. A lot of them agree and a lot of them say I should get together and have <laughs> put on my own festival. Well, that's impossible. I don't have the funds to do that. They also mention that they try to spread things out. They give, for an example, the 4th of July parade. Well, since Evil Knievel left this town, the 4th of July parade is nothing. I mean, if it's on a weekend, everybody goes camping and they pretty much use my facility to use the bathroom. And that's about it. They bring their own pop, their own liquor, and whatnot to the parade. So that's not a big benefit for downtown Butte bars. You don't do anything for downtown Butte bars, basically. I don't know if it's for control as far as underage drinking, but I also see a lot of young people leave uptown Butte pretty hammered, so I don't think that's very effective either. Um, and I'm not sure the legalities of it. I'm not sure if I need to check into it, but... I would like an answer. I know you can't respond today. This is what I've heard. I'm not sure it's true. The Butte Silver Bowl government is pretty much the one that sells the alcohol at the folk festival, which, according to Montana administrative rules, is legal if they're given permission to do so. I disagree with the examples because in the administrative rules it says, i.e., small events like a county fair, a national folk festival is a little bigger than that. <laughs> and, uh, just in closing, I'd like to just mention the money that our government gives away. 18 years I've been in business. I've employed people in Butte for 18 years. I've worked my butt off of jobs plus run a business. But now I was, is at risk. And I get tired of seeing all the money given away to businesses that don't even vote, but aren't from here. Uh, and it starts from years and years ago when we were throwing money at the frozen food place. A lot of them never even came here. And we give them 50 to 70 grand. You know, our, our former chief executive gave 50 grand to a pizza company, he failed to mention to anybody. I could pay my mortgage off of that, you know, to be honest with you. 50 grand to Thompson's, which I don't know, I never got an answer whether they got the money. I came up here to the public hearing and protested it, then they bought another building. But when I asked, I never got an answer whether they got the money that was approved for them. Recently, Fairview, 67,000 demolition or whatever. You know, I just like to mention, uh, in closing, I moved here in 1975. I'm from out of state. If that's a prerequisite to get money, I'd like to ask for 50,000. Thank you. And have an ICD. Any other public comment on any public matter not on the agenda? Seeing none, I would make here, I would look for a motion to adjourn. Commissioner Walker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would make a motion to adjourn. Second. Motion made and seconded to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Hearing none, motion passes. Thank you. <coughs>